Joining me to discuss the Indian side of the debate is MJ Akbar from New Delhi. He is an author, journalist and the national spokesperson for the Indian Prime Minister and the BJP, the party currently in government in India. Mr. Akbar, thanks for joining us. We have had a new flare-up of violence in Kashmir. No, this poses a challenge for India. How does the new government of Narendra Modi handle this latest flare-up of violence? I'd like to correct that a bit, Anand, if I may. There isn't a flare-up of violence in Kashmir. There's a flare-up of violence on the ceasefire line or on the border between India and Pakistan across Kashmir, and this is provocation. In fact, uh, the provocation from Pakistan has been an absolute continuous feature for the last many, many years. And uh, as far as the Indian public is concerned, you know, frankly, if you, if you want a frank answer, the Indian public is absolutely, you know, almost beyond the acrimony stage, where it is, it's reaching a post-hostility syndrome because of Pakistan's uh, uh, complete unwillingness to do anything about the terrorist attacks, about its continued efforts to sabotage any peace effort uh, with uh, artillery, uh, cross-border cross artillery firing. If you want uh, to compare the borders, then all you have to do is compare the borders between India and Pakistan and India and China. As you know, India and China have differences over the border, 4,000 kilometers of borders, substantial differences. But since 1988, if I'm not wrong, there hasn't been a shot fired in anger because both nations are mature nations. They understand that, you know, the first priority of a nation is the economic development of the people. And as far as our prime minister's foreign policy objectives are concerned, I would like to make this absolutely categorically clear that his principal objective is the economy and is to remove, to lift India from this reputation and the reality of poverty into prosperity. His domestic policies, his foreign policies are all geared to that, and that is the basis of his Act East policy. Because when, you know, we look east from Delhi, we find opportunity, economic partnership, whether, you know, whether Japan, with China, with uh, nations, you know, with, with which we have varying degrees of relationship, with Nepal in our neighborhood, with Bangladesh, with Sri Lanka, there is an economy to discuss and to be a partner with. But when we look to our west from Pakistan onwards, we see a frozen tundra of violence, of battlefields, and of militias rising from dark shadows and in a vacuum where governance really has been abandoned and where uh, shadow armies have uh, taken to place governments. Okay. And for us, that is a major security interest. We are aware of the problems rising from these militias as well as from more substantial and successful groups like the Islamic State. And we are doing what we can to, uh, to protect our security, but our opportunities lie to the east. Okay, so let me ask you about uh, what you just described as a frozen tundra when you look west. How does India change that? Well, our first priority is to find the partners uh, internationally who can recognize the serious and, and sort of extensive danger. If you actually look at it, Anand, from, uh, from really from the border of Amritsar, right stretching across to North Africa, with some exceptions, I'm not saying all the nations are, are like that, with some exceptions, but you see mostly, vastly, a great international battlefield in which borders have, are becoming virtually meaningless. Governance is disappearing. And we need an international alliance. And I tell you, this terrorism, which is being practiced in the name of theocracy, in the name of one particular religion, is a danger to all nations which seek, which seek stability and economic progress, not least China. I think that China is going to face dangers in Xinjiang from uh, terrorists who have their sanctuaries uh, in Pakistan. And I'm sure at some point we will find the ability, many nations together will find the ability to recognize the common nature and act in some concert against this common threat. Okay, so it might be one thing to play the blame game here and blame Pakistan for what is happening, but is Prime Minister Narendra Modi prepared to enter into the difficult negotiations that will have to take place, the hard compromises that will have to be made to reach an agreement with Pakistan? 
We have made one thing very clear, and I think this has been a, a principle uh, which has been adopted by the government, that we are ready to talk. After all, Prime Minister Narendra Modi made the first substantive, uh, it was such a gesture that it took the world and the region by surprise when he invited the Prime Minister of Pakistan to his swearing in ceremony. And it was a great, uh, it was a great meeting that the two had, that had uh, uh, in Delhi. That meeting was very optimistic about the future. A foreign secretary level stocks were scheduled and promised. And then, and then, Pakistan quite uh, flagrantly disobeyed or ignored or, in fact, violated a suggestion or, or a uh, hint, if you like, actually a specific statement made to the Pakistan High Commissioner that we will not negotiate under the shadow of terrorism we will talk as equal and as potential friends, but we will not negotiate under the shadow of terrorism. So please do not talk to secessionists before that. And the Pakistan High Commissioner quite consciously and deliberately, despite receiving uh, the very clear message from Delhi, uh, went ahead. And that was the, he, it was Pakistan which uh, destroyed that opportunity. I'm wondering what the contours of a settlement would look like from India's point of view. You know, in 2010, there was a survey that was carried out in Indian-controlled Kashmir in which two-thirds of those surveyed said they prefer independence. I mean, would India be prepared to go that far, to grant independence to Kashmir uh, or really a large degree of autonomy? There is no question of independence. I mean, anyone who talks of independence is talking through not one, but multiple hats. I mean, it's a nonsense. There is no independence anywhere on the agenda. If you look at it even historically, you must remember that under the act of independence by which, uh, you know, we became free nations from British rule, uh, there was no, no permission or no legality for any third nation to emerge uh, except India and Pakistan. So that question is totally out. Uh, does India recognize the urgency of reaching a settlement? Because we do know that, you know, both India and Pakistan are nuclear powers. Uh, there is a danger, perhaps, of this escalating to a point where there could be a nuclear exchange. In fact, in 2002, Bill Clinton, the former president of the United States, said pretty famously, he said, Kashmir is, quote, the most dangerous place in the world. Well, uh, that was Bill Clinton's view. And uh, while we accept that uh, there are dangers. You know, India and Pakistan have also uh, been nuclear powers in effect, de facto nuclear powers for some time now. And I think there are uh, people on both sides of the border who understand their responsibilities. In any case, uh, we don't negotiate under any kind of blackmail or under any kind of threat. We negotiate on the basis of our national sovereign rights and principles. And any nation with any self-respect does the same. India and Pakistan has so much in common. Uh, you have the same culture. You're a country that was effectively partitioned by the British after independence. Why is it so difficult to reach an agreement then? The difficult, you know, I, I often think about this. I, my books are on this subject. My last one was Tinderbox, The Past and Future of Pakistan. But over eight books, I've thought about this at some length. And uh, I often think that the problem uh, is not geographical. The problem is ideological. It is essentially a conflict between the idea of a liberal democracy, a secular liberal democracy, in which all faiths have freedom of uh, practice, all faiths are equal, not merely before the law, but before so in, so in society and in, with the people, and a theocracy which is built as a fortress of one faith. And I think even, even Pakistan's democracy, its internal democracy, is imperiled by its theocratic impulses. That is why uh, Pakistan seems to be in complete uh, conflict. I have at some point described this and other nations like it uh, as a jelly state. You know, they will, they will not disappear, but they will constantly quiver, quiver. They will always be unstable because they have uh, uh, a theocratic uh, center of gravity. And then, of course, on top of it, they have terrorist uh, sanctuaries, which make them toxic. And as you mentioned, nuclear power. So it's quite a dangerous combination. MJ Akbar, great chatting with you, sir. Thank you very much for being with us on the show. Well, we heard from the Indian side about the dispute. Next, we'll hear from a panel of Pakistani experts. Stay with us. You're on the heat.